Good afternoon, everyone. We're really excited to see all you awesome people here today coming to learn about a super interesting topic. My name is Eric Rossborough. I am associate librarian at the McCracken Research Library right down the hall. I invite everyone here to come check us out and read some books. We are open to the public. Anyway, we're really excited to present this uh, new installment in our Bob Richard lecture series. I'm particularly interested in this topic. Uh, in my life, I've fished and boated a lot of reservoirs. I've enjoyed uh, fishing in the Buffalo Bill Reservoir. But when you're there, you always kind of wonder, what did it look like? before you know, they put the dam in. Today we're gonna find out about the beautiful uh, Bighorn Canyon before it had the dam in. And if you didn't know, I will introduce the man of the hour. We got Mac Frost here on the, uh, on the computer. Thank you, Mac. I'd also like to thank John Gallagher, Sam Hanna, and Bill Eagler for helping me set everything up. I really couldn't have done it without them. They bailed me out in more than one way. But anyway, if you don't know who Bob is, this is from his bio, Frost and Richard Camping Company, Journey to Yellowstone, which is for sale in the bookstore along with his other pieces of war. And you can get a signed copy after, but Bob was born and raised on a ranch in northwestern Wyoming. He has deep roots in western soils. He has worked on guest ranches, guiding horse and hunting trips. He's not kidding about that. He's told me more stories than you guys have heard in my working with him. He started guiding when he was like, what, 10? 11. He started his hunting guide career at 11 years old. He was a Marine Corps pilot. He was a swim coach, a rancher. He ran grub stake expeditions leading tours to Yellowstone uh, for decades. And most recently, he is an author and a speaker who has been entertaining us to our great education and entertainment every month. And with that, I give you Bob Richard. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Uh, lots of old friends new friends, and back on the back table, if you didn't pick one up, is uh, the visitor's pamphlet for the Bighorn Canyon National Recreation Area. It also has a map, and also there's some uh, pamphlets on the Bad Pass Trail, which we'll talk about today. And when I started and put this down as a talking uh, date, I thought Dad was the only one that went on the last float down the Bighorn River. I found there were several last down the river Bighorn trips. And uh, Dad and Bud Webster seemed to make all of them. And uh, we'll talk about all this as I go through. Uh, the one that Dad went on after it took me a while to sort it out was with the Wyoming Game and Fish, the National Park Service, uh, the Montana Game and Fish, Bureau of Reclamation, and uh, several dignitaries. And then I found, as I was working with Mac to get the photographs, lo and behold, the Park Service at Bighorn Canyon took Dad and the Cody Club and Bud Webster again down before they opened the lake up in the Park Service boat and made another visit. And rather than try and put everything together, we'll have some photographs we'll share with you, but I have the newspaper articles laid out here on the front you can come up and look at after the talk. And if you have questions, uh, either ask them as we go along or Preferably, I try to do the last 15 minutes. But thank you for being here. Uh, and we have one of the uh, Park Service really interested uh, guide and gave me a guided tour a few weeks ago, Todd Johnson, who will be here to help me with questions. And then we have an old timer, retired, but he isn't really old, he's a youngster, and that's Chris Finley. And Chris is the one that helped put 
all the ranches back together uh, down at the park. And we're going to look at some of those and talk a little bit about it. And Chris will be here to answer questions afterwards. But uh, thank you all for coming. And I have a young man that came in and told me that he went down the river with dad and the Wyoming Game and Fish when his dad was with the Wyoming Game and Fish. Uh, he was 11 years old and got to float down. And thank you for being here. Uh, but it's fun to see you, and we'll get started. You're going the wrong way. There you go. <laughs> this I found, or Mac found, this is Charlie Belden, probably in the 30s, in one of the boats uh, from Hillsboro, and he painted on the side of it, uh, Spirit of the LU, and on the other side, we'll see a picture, uh, the Spirit of the Pitchfork Ranch. And he shot movies, and I've tracked the movies down. I think they're in Harden, but I couldn't get them for this talk. This is, there is one of these boats left, uh, and it's in the visitor center in Lovell. Now that gives you a feel for what it looked like in those days. This is a third photograph with Charlie Belden. They're old. Here they are, and we're going to have a couple more uh, photographs of this, but this is coming through some rapids, and you can see the spirit of the uh, pitchfork. This is an aerial of dads looking at the canyon. Uh, it's pretty spectacular. And this also was the Bad Pass Trail that was used for over 10,000 years by the Native Americans, and we'll talk more about it, but also the trappers of the American fur trade came out of the Wind River Mountains and came out this way and went down the river all the way to St. Louis. South. Looking south, the question was, yes, This is a general shot. Uh, there's a boat. I gotta find the. Where? No, I want the the boat. Okay, go back. I want to. I want to press the button. Right oh, there. for the laser. Yeah. Right there's the boat. This occurred in August of 1962. 20th of August through the 25th. Only takes a couple of days to go through, but they had to check the fish check the timber, that type of thing. And uh, they ate f trout quite a bit. Dad wrote to me and told me about this trip as I was flying off carriers at the time. And uh, I envied, because as a scout, we planned to do a float through the canyon and then all the way one summer down to New Orleans. Didn't make it but uh, it was one of our dreams. We built our own canoes in scouting and it was quite a project. Now, the man in the back of the boat and uh, was the fish biologist for Cody for years and years and years and I recognize him by the pipe. This is Louis Pacek. 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 And uh, I just called him Louie. It was a lot easier. But he was everywhere planting fish and, 
involved in the community and represented uh, the Wyoming game and fish here uh, for a lot of years. You'll notice some of them are wearing their life jackets. Today they all would wear them. This is coming out of the canyon down near the dam. They were brave souls in a small, I would say, surplus raft, and they had a motor on the back end. One of those thousand foot cliffs. I wish that I had gotten down the river with dad that day or that week. If you go out on the lake today in the summer and take one of the guided trips or take your boat and go down, uh, you will see big ram mountain sheep on those cliffs. How they get there, I don't know. They this climb. They, climb. They, they walk on the sky. Anyway, uh, here are the people involved in that trip. And... Uh, Dad wrote some things down here that I thought was kind of representative of his whole trip, and I want to read it to you. Uh, Ron Bell was the one that was with a game and fish here and invited Dad to go, and uh, Dad made some quotes here. They're also in the newspapers in front of us, but uh, there, well, I have it, but I can't find it. Anyway, he talked about the beauty of the trip, the quietness, the comradeship with the other men camping out and breathing the fresh air and the solitude of that trip. And, uh, Ken Winter was also one of the game and fish people on that trip. And, uh, well, we'll get into more of it later. But, all right, let's keep going here. Pretty steep canyons. While they were floating the river, uh, they had archaeological studies going on uh, next to the river, and uh, there were several different groups doing that uh, that were spending more than a week or two. They were really digging and trying to get as much information on Native Americans and other things. Uh, here is a Park Service boat, power boat, and uh, uh, I think it's an airboat. Uh, it looks to me like an airplane engine, and they're lots of fun. Low draft. This is where they were doing one of the digs. They stopped for lunch here. You can see down near the uh, bottom. Uh, I learned at a young age of 12 that I did not want to be an archeologist with a paintbrush and a toothbrush, cleaning things and picking things apart. Uh, I enjoyed finding the artifacts, but I found that I just didn't have the patience. And I assume their studies are uh, in the archives at the Lovell uh, Office Visitor Center. This is having lunch with them. And if, how do I get that red light? Down a little bit. There you go. That hat tells me that's probably Cal Taggart. 
Here they're checking grapes that were growing along the shoreline. This is Louis uh, doing something with a trout. And they were, this is a freshwater stream coming into the river. Again, coming from the left, you'll see the fresh water coming in. Uh, and there's a man, a couple of men down there checking trout, who knows. You know, the, the river itself is in kind of, well, not re necessarily flood stage, but it's got a lot of dirt and mud in it. But you can see the water coming in down here from the creek and flowing out into the edge of the, of the river and clearing out the mud. This is one of the rafts they were coming down the river on. And next. This is uh, going back to the 30s in the same area. Next. That had to have been a spectacular trip. Okay. Next. Next. Lots of caves. Some of them had, uh, were used by Native Americans and some weren't. Uh, and I've learned from Chris that uh, if it went straight back and it didn't slope out, there was more of a chance of their being used uh, by early day people, okay? There's a boat down at the lower part. A big spire up there. <laughs> Next. Next. I think some of those cliffs went up to almost 2,000 feet. Okay. They were looking at something up there, but I'm not sure what. I read these things time and time again down here, but I can't put them all together with the photographs. But it gives you a, a real feel for the area. This is a cedar tree, and in the cedar tree it had a uh, tin box, and uh, in it was a mining claim. But uh, that is one of the biggest cedar trees I've seen. Next. Next. You can get an idea of the scale of this whole thing by seeing the boat right here. how high the lake comes up, uh, I would say probably... It probably, whoops, um, it probably comes up to right about in here. Um, almost halfway. Or it, it, depends on, it depends on your location within the canyon. You know, the upper um, end of the canyon, uh, you're not gonna have it uh, as full. Uh, you only have to go out to the uh, uh, Devil's Canyon Overlook and look down, you can see the water line. But uh, Todd's uh, our expert. <laughs> or we'll get him to comment on it at question time. Or do you want to comment on it? Okay. The uh, rubber raft has been patched several times. In those days, the game and fish didn't have as much money. Now we're getting down towards the uh, north end of the canyon where the they were getting ready to construct the dam. You can see the work starting there on the right. This was Friday morning of their 
five-day trip. That's a big dump truck. This is that same uh, piece of machinery, but from a little bit further down the river, looking back up at, um, I'm not sure what that tower was, but it was part of the construction uh, project, probably for controlling uh, the movable cement dumps. This is their takeout point, and uh, you can see some big pumps that are pumping water off to the left. <clears throat> and this is on the north end of the reservoir where the dam was being prepared. Next. This is the dam site before the dam was built. They're in the prep preparation of doing it, but uh, the dam went in right about here. Next. And if you look carefully, this area up here is what's known as Oka Bay. That is where the, uh, the boat docks are in the uh, northern end. And you have to you have to go around the bottom of the uh, uh, the hills here, up and around, to get out to Oka Bay. It's a kind of a roundabout way of doing it, but it's the easiest way to to get to the water. Okay. Now we're going to introduce you to today and the visitor center. And uh, this is on the edge of Lovell. And uh, it's a treat to go in there and uh, visit their display. They've moved the only boat left out of a collection of, what, six or seven boats that they had. The rest were burned, but they salvaged one. Next. And Cal Taggart, the town father, mayor, state senator, but his greatest dream was to get the dam built and the canyon. He loved to take people down it, and he went a, a lot of trips. Uh, and I would love to know how many trips he did, but it was his love. He loved the Bighorn River and everything that went with it. And... There's a, a brass plaque as you go in the visitor center. And uh, there's the man that probably had more to do with getting this uh, national uh, recreation area put together. And thank you to him and his family. Next. This is the only boat left that was built and used to come down the canyon during uh, Dr. Barry's time. And uh, they were all burned but one. And it's there in the visitor center. And uh, next, that's a view that they have in the visitor center showing uh, the map from the uh, south end going north. If I recall, they used to have this horizontal on a table. And it's a, a little bit more accessible now that it's up on the wall. But it's a it's a pretty Im impressive looking uh, relief map. If you ever get it down there to the visitor center, be sure that you uh, take a look at it. Okay, we're going to do a video for you uh, that the Park Service furnished. It's ten minutes long, and I liked it so well. I said, let's include it. So uh, Today, here we go. Visitors to the Bighorn Canyon National Recreation Area see a calm lake. Hang on a second here. Ah. Well, 
we've yeah. had difficulty trying to put this on this. And uh, give us a minute. Today, visitors to the Bighorn Canyon National Recreation Area see a calm lake. Well, what the heck? I mean, it's working, working earlier. <laughs> Max, the expert. <laughs> Right. Well, we tried it several times and it was working, but uh, if not, I would say that take a trip down, go to the visitor center, and take the 10 minutes to watch this. It's right above the boat. And when I was down there two weeks ago, I sat there and uh, uh, it was a delight to watch it, and I thought you would like it, but I'm sensing we're not going to succeed. Just a second. Mac has said just a second a time before, too. Before the Yellowtail Dam was built during the 1960s, it was a much different place rough, dangerous, wild. For thousands of years, prehistoric peoples bypassed the untamed river on the Bad Pass Trail. Mountain men who trapped for fur in the area also used the Bad Pass Trail to avoid the dangers of taking their year's work down the unforgiving waterway. Jim Bridger, the famous Western explorer, floated the river in 1825, making him the first European to record the harrowing ride. Bridger told of the majestic Bighorn Canyon, with walls and arches so steep that they seemed to block out the sun. The river flowed, swirling between calm water with banks and streams, and at times moving so fast through the narrow valleys and rocks, it seemed that Bridger was floating atop foam. In 1913, three men, Doc Barry, Claude St. John, and Dilbert Smith, as a publicity stunt, traveled from Barry's Dude Ranch in Montana to New Orleans. The roughest part of their journey was from Hillsboro to Hardin, Montana. We had many narrow escapes as the boat seemed to touch rock after rock as she dipped her bows into the eddies, while the turbulent water threw sprays so thick the other occupants of the boat could not be seen jumped in a hole and out again, drowned the engine and ignition, swamped the boat half a dozen times and had to bail her out. <laughs> Traveling through the Bighorn Canyon was a harrowing and dangerous practice which only the stoutest of adventurers accomplished, but that didn't stop people from trying. In the late 1940s, Bernard Pease and his brothers went elk hunting in the canyon and found out firsthand how treacherous the river could be. We come around this corner and there were some elk right there, so we pulled the boat over. My one brother shot a bull, a big bull. So we went to our boat with the elk behind us and we started down the canyon again. All of a sudden we heard them rapids again and that boat just made a complete turnaround. Now there's a wave coming up over the top of our boat. It was pulling it that fast. So we turned a corner and one of our tent poles hit a rock and that cut a hole in the one boat and then the boat went down. Bernard and his brothers walked out of the canyon. Their story made national headlines, but they were not the last to feel the wrath of the canyon's treacherous waters. In the late 1940s, not long after the Pease brothers nearly met their end, Jack Pearson and three friends with no rough water rafting experience tried their hand at the Bighorn Canyon. It nearly proved deadly. We didn't have any trouble at all till the last day at Black Canyon. We hit turbulent water that we couldn't handle and just flipped the boat over and capsized. Willis Guthrie couldn't swim. He was wearing a Mae West life jacket. He was under the boat and the first thing he did was pull the ripcord and it plastered him up against the bottom of the boat and he couldn't find his way out. We finally found his legs and pulled him up to the shore, laid him on his stomach, beat on his back, and the water just came pouring out of him. He was in trouble. Despite the near-death experiences of members of the Pease and Pearson crews, floaters continued risking their lives on the rapids of the Bighorn River. Jim Hamilton of Decker, Montana, and Tom Ringley of Bighorn, Wyoming, floated the river in the 1950s and early 60s, before the Yellowtail Dam was built. 
they clearly remember the sound of the rapids. But I remember that you could hear these rapids roaring up ahead, but you couldn't see them because there might be a sheer wall. Then the canyon would turn 90 degrees, and you come on the rapids and you go through them, but you could really hear them roar. It was a fun trip. Floating the Bighorn River wasn't all danger. It usually took three days to complete the trip, so camping was required. Camping would be a peaceful experience. Jim Hamilton described feeling like the only person on the planet while sleeping under the night sky. When you're talking about laying around at night, I can remember we had no tent. We were just in our bedrolls, our sleeping bags. Camping in the canyon before the dam offered views of wildlife that most people rarely got to see. During our 1954 Bighorn Canyon trip, and while we camped at the mouth of Black Canyon, Durfee and I climbed the south wall of Black Canyon and covered a good bit of the area between Black and Bull Elk Canyons. As well as seeing several hundred buffalo, we jumped some very, very good buck deer. The following day, we all went up on top and all saw many buffalo. Bob Musgrave wasn't alone when he first rafted the river. Howard Honefinger, John T. Fuller, Bert Miller, Hollis Honefinger, Dewey Aiken, Dutch Hollisher, Arden Durfee, and Johnny Honefinger braved the river with him during two trips in the mid-1950s. Not all the animals seen were desirable ones. Ralph Bond recalls, First thing that happened when we got out of the boat was we come on a rattlesnake. We had to sleep there that night. One of the guys, he wouldn't sleep on the ground. He got in the boat and slept in the boat. David D. Thompson Jr., the expedition commander of the last float trip before the dam was completed in the 1960s, described the smell of breakfast cooking in the canyon while waking up the morning after the first day of floating. The first night, the group camped at Barry's Landing. It was a beautiful place to camp, and although nature dampened our spirits somewhat during the day and following morning, the aroma of coffee cooking in the open and the smell of eggs, pancakes, and syrup permeated the air. Most everyone awakened with a ravenous appetite, which was quickly assaged by our chief cook, Wes Meeker. There was a general consensus of opinion by those who were queried that Wes did a fine job. I gained three and a quarter pounds on a trip that should have probably pulled some of the beef from around many of our rotund little figures. Floating and camping in the canyon also showed people the remains of days gone by. Floaters saw traces left behind by prehistoric people and those who had tried mining the canyon. Most campers brought food for their trip through the canyon, but could always rely on catching fish. There were numerous streams leading into the canyon and the river in the days before the dam was completed. Trout were in abundance in those days. Fishing was also just a great way to relax after the wild ride of the rapids. That was the campsite the first night. It was a good little fishing stream back up there and pretty good campsite at Devil's Canyon. I'd fished the river somewhat with my father in the early 60s. Before the dam, there was catfish laying, carp, suckers. If we went up high, where Fort Smith is now to the old head gate where they took out the irrigation water, you could occasionally catch a brown trout. There weren't very many, but if you caught one, hmm, it was something that you talked about. Some people hated to see the dam tame the river because they wanted the wild river to run free forever. But others knew that the dam would provide recreation, electricity, flood control, and water for irrigating farms. Every positive has a negative, just as every negative has a positive. Most of the people were for it. They could see the need for water storage and then when they could see that the side benefit was boating, fishing, and what have you. Then about in the mid-60s, they started construction on the Yellowtail Dam, which was a big economic impact to the area. Hardin prospered very well due to the construction of the dam. That's when the little town of Fort Smith came about. There were three or four gas stations, a couple grocery stores, a couple of cafes. I mean, Fort Smith was a bustling little construction camp. No, I think the dam is great. It provides a lot of power and recreation. Recreation for a lot of people who wouldn't make that float trip. I used to have a 25-foot cabin cruiser that we'd use when some of my friends came to Lovell and put it in and spend a couple nights on the lake. That was a good trip. 
Although the lake took away the exhilarating rides down the rough river, it provides opportunities for improving the economy of the area. It also provides visitors with a chance to see the canyon from the inside, which many people couldn't before the lake existed. Only the stout river rats were able to see inside of the canyon before the dam. The best way to see Bighorn Canyon National Recreation Area is by taking a boat ride on the lake through the beautiful canyon walls. Thank you, Mac. And now we'll do the other half. I really like that. Mac just has to find her place. Okay. Uh, well, I need to give him a little more training, but you know. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, Bob. <laughs> He is my cousin. I get away with yeah. it till later. <laughs> okay, let's see here. I think that's a good place to start, Mac. Yeah, one would think. Oops. No. Nope. Darn it. Give me a minute here. Oh, we get to see it all a second time. Yeah. Anyway, pretty spectacular. And uh, there's been two or three groups that have gone all the way to New Orleans. The last group was in about 59. And uh, what an undertaking. I'm glad I didn't tackle it. I was bound determined to do that one summer. But for some reason, I ended up going to work and making money to buy a Jeep instead. But. All right, here we are as the entrance. This is the superintendent. He's took over about a month ago, lives here in Cody, and he has uh, the park. He has uh, uh, several other parks he's responsible for also. Uh, uh, the tower in the eastern part of uh, Wyoming and Fort Laramie, Devil's Tower. And uh, this is the man that has the background and I think will uh, lend a lot to continue working with these parks. Uh, Christy Fleming is the chief of interpretation, works out of the Lovell office, and uh, she has been a part of our communities for a number of years and uh, uh, loves what she's doing and she was spending a lot of time uh, under the tutelage of Chris Finley. Chris had her in college at, when he was teaching there, as well as many others. But next. I was uh, asked by the museum here to do some tours, and I ended up doing two tours uh, down there. And we had 50 people on the Powder River buses and this was taken at Devil's Canyon Overlook. And this was a Powder River bus that I also managed during my career as a uh, Grub Stake Expeditions tour operator uh, in the area. Next. This is one of Max's photographs. And that's looking down the canyon. 
Next. Yeah, that's looking downriver to the north. Yes. Well, it is down the canyon. You, you go over on the other side <laughs> of the of the overlook. You got to hit the right button, Mac. Yeah, no kidding. There it is. <laughs> and you'll notice the boat down here, way down in the bottom. <laughs> Next. You could also see, you know, where the water line is when when they, the they get enough up. when they get enough water in there. They did that what a couple of years ago. They were able to fill the the dam pretty much. I don't I don't know if they're going to get it done this year, but oh, sure they are. We had lots of snow last week. Yeah. Here's a ram, and uh, we don't see too many of them on the west side of the uh, lake, but uh, uh, they're there. And uh, this is a nice looking ram. Next, this is one of the ewes. Lots of ewes. I had travel riders here. 15 years ago, and I'd taken them on a tour through the park. And then uh, Claudia Wade, who was running the Park County Travel, said, Bob, I have offered your services for any of the riders that want to meet with you. And two of the riders called me and said, Bob, we heard you can show us anything we want to see. And I said, well, I'd try. And they said, well, we want to see wild horses and mountain sheep. And I said, fine, how much time do we have? Well, we have four hours before the rodeo. I said, I'll pick you up at the motel. And I took them right down to the Bighorn uh, Canyon Recreation Area. And I showed them the mountain sheep. I showed them the horses. And I said, is there anything else you want to see? <laughs> and they wrote up a great story. But I got lucky, too. A little bit on the mountain men on the Bad Pass Trail. I'm fascinated by this, and we'll look at more of it, but uh, there's handouts back in the back on it, and uh, you can see the trail uh, throughout the park, and uh, uh, they preserve them, and uh, uh, thanks to Chris Finley, he worked hard to make sure that some of these things were preserved. And next, this shows starting uh, all the way in uh, lower Wyoming, down the Wind River, and then the Bighorn, uh, and down the Yellowstone, down the Missouri, and then to the Mississippi. This is a more of a close-up. Next. Here's the Devil's Canyon Overlook here in the bath. Bad Pass Trail goes all the way up here to Fort, past Fort Smith. 10,000 years. Yeah. Oh, you you got to press, press it again. There we go. This is a Ewing Snell Historic Ranch site, and we're going to talk just a little bit and show you some photographs. And we stopped here with the uh, Powder River bus twice, but this day, uh, it was a pretty good day. Next. Uh, you recognize that guy in the blue sweater? That's Al Simpson. And Al was on, he asked more questions than anybody else. But uh, anyway, he was walking down the schoolhouse. Uh, and that's the cabin that since uh, we've lost to a fire. Next. It started raining that afternoon. Next. This is after the fire, and uh, the Park Service is now looking to reestablish that building. And uh, they've covered it, checked the foundation, and hopefully we'll see uh, some sort of visitor center or study center there soon. And in the distance is one of the old schoolhouses. Next. That's a close-up of the schoolhouse. Now, all these buildings have been restored under the guidance of uh, Chris Finley. Logs were replaced. The roofs were all replaced. Uh, the dirt was planted. I mean, he had spent years before he retired getting these ranches back to where you look at them and you think that uh, it was there from yesterday. Next. This is the barn. And Chris, if I make a mistake, 
correct me, okay? Please. Next. This is some of the farm equipment that was used there, and it had been scattered all over Lovell. And Chris and all the other people down there searched and got the different pieces of uh, equipment returned and displayed there at the Ewing Snell Ranch. I used to run one of these. This is a buck rake, and you put a horse on each side, and the front end, the upper part, had uh, big, uh, well, I call them spears, but it picked up the hay, and you took it into the overshot stacker, and then horses pulled it and dumped it into a haystack. This is a mower that, as a kid, I used to run. And uh, when we got our first tractor, I thought that was a big deal, let me tell you. Next. Uh, then we moved up to the Carolyn Lockhart Ranch, and, and Chris says, well, there is a back road in there. And my bus driver, who spent 30 years with Greyhound, now working for, or was working for uh, uh, Powder River, he says, well, let's take that road. And Chris says, well, it's just a Jeep road. And, uh, my driver says, I can take this bus anywhere you can take a Jeep. And we drove in to the Lockhart Ranch. And I thought, oh, how am I going to explain this? Uh, but in we went. And uh, next, a uh, little thing that's on a board there as you get to the ranch. And by the way, most of these signs have been done by Northwest College. And this one needs a little bit of attention, but Northwest College, working with the Park Service, really has done a good job of signage and explaining things. Next. This is a book that I have, and it's sold out at the Visitor Center, and it tells who the players are, who the people were with the real names, uh, and not just the names when she wrote the book. But I have one of the original books signed to my grandfather as a partner in crime. And I'm not sure what that meant, and granddad would never tell me. The big story there is my granddad and my uncle and I, when we were 12, next, uh, went there at a young age, and we bought five horses from Carolyn took us all day to get there, and uh, they hadn't gotten the horses in, and Dave Good was her boyfriend that was living with her, and he was too old to get on a horse, but they had a wrangle horse. I spent the next day gathering 70 head of horses, bringing them in, and then we, the next morning, sorted and picked out five gildings that were three-year-olds, had to mouth them. That took us most of the day. And so we spent another night there, and then we loaded the five up, took them back to the ranch on the North Fork. And uh, at that age, I was given the opportunity to break all five horses. Next. Uh, this is Chris. He's retired from uh, the National Park Service. He's a cultural resource program manager and he put his heart into these uh, different ranches. Next. This is the uh, Buffalo Bill Center of the West group that was on tour that day, and this is at Carolyn's house. Next. Note the fireplace. See the L slash heart. And that was Carolyn's brand, and my granddad looked at her and said, Carolyn? We don't have to put a slash across your brand. You already have it. Because when we bought horses, we put a slash across the brand that was there and then put our brand on the horse. And Carolyn didn't like the idea that the slash was already there. But next. Uh, this is my wife in the guest house that my granddad and I slept in. And look at the little heart up to the right. And the man that built the uh, fireplace put a padlock above the slash. And Carolyn Lockhart looked at that and wouldn't pay him. And then she chiseled off the padlock 
and the guy never got paid for building the fireplace. Next. There it is. But she was pretty upset about that. Yeah, and he put the slash head backwards, too. Yes, he did. Uh, this is Todd, and he was showing us uh, a buffalo jump right there by the Lockhart Ranch. And, uh, I mean, what a treat to have Todd give a full day of his time taking us to these ranches and seeing this. Next. This is the barn. This is where uh, Dave Good milked a cow. And uh, all these logs were replaced because they were all rotten. And uh, Chris went all over the country with a lot of help from others and gathered fresh logs or other logs that were in better condition and rebuilt this ranch and the next one we're going to look at. Uh, Todd, isn't this up here, the Dry Head Vista? Yes. Um, this spot right up here on the top of the East Prior Mountains, you can drive to in a family car. We've got a nice uh, Forest Service road up there. If you ever have the chance to go up there, preferably in July or August, um, it's, a, it's a pretty neat uh, site because you can look right down on the Lockhart Ranch and all of the, the, the Dry Head Basin. Now, all the different buildings, this is the spring house, are marked with explanations. And uh, next, uh, looking in there, that's watercress at the bottom. But this is where they kept their eggs and milk cold. That was their refrigeration. Next. This is a lock, and this is uh, one of the original uh, latches and people that come and visit have been taking them and they've lost most of them and i've got an uncle that's supposed to uh make me some i like them and i'm going to put them on my son's uh hoop houses out at the shoshone river farms uh, then we go to hillsboro and uh, there's a hiking trail but if you're old like i am you can ask the visitor center and they'll give you a key so you can drive in and uh, either ranch and that's quite a treat. Next. And we got to drive in this day because we had the guide with us. And this is another spring house. Look at the thickness of the walls and they had running water going into it. Next. This is where they put the uh, eggs and milk and what have you. And they had water coming in up on the right-hand corner. You can see where the pipe comes in. And all this is, was restored over years and years with Chris's supervision and involvement. Next. This is just part of an old barn and a door. Next. There's another lock. This uh, lock was... Uh, made for Chris and he had a dozen of them made and most of them have disappeared. But I think that it's one of the best latches. We had them on our ranch and growing up and I'm gonna have some on Scott's farm, let me tell you. Next. That's the post office at Hillsboro. And that's totally been restored. Next. Uh, this is down at Barry's Landing and uh, that's a patrol boat that they have there in the summer. And uh, the lake's down right now, but it uh, gives you an idea of what's going on. It also gives you an idea of how far up the side of the canyon the water actually gets. Uh, here's Chris talking about teepee rings and some of the people on our tour. You probably recognize some of them. Next. Next to it is the Prior Mountain Wild Horse Range, Britain Springs Administrative Site. Next. Uh, there's a wild horse and a colt. Next. And he's laying down there and he's not going to be disturbed. Next. When you're leaving the Wild Horse Range and throughout on the drive, you'll see piles of horse manure. 
This is what we call a stud pile. And the studs mark their range. Next. Uh, boating tours at the Horseshoe Bend Marina and Campground. They're great uh, tours. There's also camping. Uh, a great place in the spring and the fall before it gets too hot. Next. There's the campsite. They have electric hookups. Next. And there's a youngster that's going out for a boat ride down and we had to carry extra gas with us. Next. Oh, he's having a good time. By the way, that's my littlest boy. Next. Uh, the Tillet Springs Fish Hatchery is there. Interesting to visit. Uh, next. Anyway, that gives you a brief, and I think we're on time for a couple of questions. And Todd, if you'll come up and join us here, uh, we'll have any questions. Uh, over here, there's a question to the right. Yes, sir. When did they take away the freight boat that they had at Barry's Landing for years? It's gone now. The only uh, boat that I'm aware of that uh, was at Barry's is the one that Bob showed up there. That was the one that went down the river, and that's the one that's actually in the visitor center right now. Yes, it was being destroyed. It was, yeah, people were vandalizing it and doing other things. So they, the decision was they made to go ahead and move it from Barry's Landing actually physically into the visitor center. Okay. Part of that also. Whoop. Part of that also was because the uh, regional uh, curator for the, the park service didn't want it outside. And so between the vandalism and the fact that it was exposed to the weather, we moved it inside. Other questions? Yes. Was there a place where you could land an airplane before the dam went in? Yes, uh, there by the Ewing Snell Ranch, there's several fields that I wouldn't hesitate to land on. Uh, so yes, and there's also a 20 acre uh, field uh, below the uh, uh, Carolyn Lockhart Ranch. But you gotta know what you're doing. There's a question in the yes, back. Yes, ma'am. The boat was restored by Pete Lovelace here in Cody. Thank you. That's good information. Thank you. He only you. did part of the boat. So go check out the boat at the visitor's center. All right. We're yes, yes ma'am. How many day trip was the pre dam raft trip down the Bighorn, and what was the rating of the rapids? It, it depended on how big a hurry they were in. Uh, you could push it and do it in two days. My dad did it in five days with the people studying and doing things. Uh, if they were fishing, uh, do you want to add to that, Chris? No? Okay. No, we got it covered. Any other questions? I can't hear very well. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Bad Pass. Bad Pass Trail. Does the Bad Pass Trail still exist and is it usable? Part of it does. When they created the park, they used part of the Bad Pass Trail for the roads. So part of it has been uh, destroyed by activity. It was also used 
as a trail for the ranchers that lived back in there. And when they started getting the automobiles in there, they modified it as well. But there's about half of it that is still intact. Yeah, and the, and the other the, the interesting story about that is, is that obviously when the park was being created, that was all before a lot of the environmental movement was actually taking place in the country. So there was no uh, NEPA, there wasn't an uh, Environmental Protection Agency, there wasn't a whole lot of other things that were going on at that time. And so that's the reason why when the road was being built, there wasn't a lot of discussion about that. If they hit, uh, if they hit ar ar archeological sites or something like that, a lot of times they would either, they would mark it or, and it would go away. Um, and that's one of the things that people learned is that obviously you know, that wasn't the right thing to do. But if you know where to look in the park, there are several areas where there's actually still markers that are there that would actually have been used by uh, either uh, Native Americans or later on trappers and settlers as they would make their way through. One thing to keep in mind with the Bad Pass Trail is that that was actually a buffalo migration route. And that's the reason why, once again, if you come to the park, we can, we can talk more about that. There's actually multiple buffalo jumps that exist, uh, former buffalo jumps that are in the park. Um, and that's, that's a really interesting part of uh, the story of the Bad Pass Trail. Oh, uh, there was all. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, Chris. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, there, I just wanted to say one thing real quick. When they built, Western Air Power Authority built the power lines through there, they impacted the Bad Pass Trail a lot as well. I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, we've run out of time. But uh, we will be here afterwards. I will be upstairs signing books. Uh, you can look at this, and I'll get back to pick it up afterwards. Uh, thank you so much for being here.